thanks for coming to the um, April um, 18th or 19th Eaton Geek. Um, again, as I mentioned before I started the recording on this, um, I will be sharing this with people on YouTube. Um, but for those who are on YouTube, I also want to mention that this is a live Eaton Geek and pretty much everyone from my company has joined in to also watch this presentation and I'll be opening it up to them. Um, at the end of the session and they'll be asking questions. Um, I wasn't able to get the audio to work where you'll be able to hear them ask questions, but I will do my best to repeat anything that they mention or say um, so that people who are watching the video at a later time can pick up on that. So um, these are all the developers that are uh, that are part of my company. Um, my company is allplayers.com. Uh, my name is Travis Tidwell. I'm uh, one of the lead developers for All Players. And every week we do what's called an Eaton Geek, where we all gather, we talk about something that's really cool, something that's interesting, and that's something that will help out um, us in, to make us better developers. This week we will be talking about, or I'll be talking about JavaScript Essentials. Um, again, I already mentioned my name is Travis Tidwell, and I mentioned my uh, company is allplayers.com. Please go and check out this website. It's amazing. Um, who is this for? Um, so this, uh, this session is, um, I'm not going to be talking about how to write JavaScript in this session. This isn't really for learning JavaScript. This session is for experienced developers who want to learn JavaScript. And basically what this means is, let's say you're a developer, you're already experienced in another language such as PHP or C++ or whatever that language may be. This session is to help you and basically teach you all the stuff that you need to know about JavaScript so that you can dive in. There are some, there are some little quirks and some little things with JavaScript that you just need to know, and that's what I'll be going over in the session. So let's talk about what we will cover. Um, I'm going to briefly cover syntax, um, and the reason is, is I'm just going to cover the syntax that you need to know. I'm not going to tell you how to write a function. I'm not going to tell you how to write for each loop. So I'm not going to tell you how you know, functions work or variables work. That's not what this session is really about. This session is about learning, you know, the the, the differences between JavaScript as versus other languages, uh, assuming you already know those languages. I'm going to talk a little bit about objects uh, because objects are really unique in JavaScript. Uh, also, I'm going to uh, go into understanding the function in JavaScript because the function basically controls everything in JavaScript and is also a big source of confusion for developers who are used to how functions work in other languages and they come into JavaScript and they're totally confused. Um, I'm also going to go into understanding the this pointer because when you're dealing with objects and you're especially dealing with object-oriented JavaScript, it is vital that you understand how the this pointer works and how it's passed around. So I'm going to go into that. Um, from there, that kind of segues into understanding what the prototype is um, in, within JavaScript, which is essential for, for developing object-oriented programming. And then I'm going to go into how you write object-oriented programming in JavaScript. And then finally, what I'm going to do is, is tie that into jQuery and teach you guys how to build a jQuery plugin with object-oriented programming. So... That's kind of a big uh, paradigm shift that I've noticed lately is, you know, uh, people are going from their old ways of developing jQuery plugins that are very just like functional programming. They just, they throw all this, this functionality into a plugin and um, without making it object oriented, it's not very portable. So hopefully by making objects and making it object oriented, they could actually easily port it to other languages or, or just um, it just it's also easier to understand so these are the things I'm going to be going over and then also I'm going to be opening it up to questions for those who are on the phone with me and again I'll probably have to repeat all the questions so that people who are watching this video at a later time can follow along so let's dive right in and let's talk a little bit about syntax um, within JavaScript the very first thing that everyone needs to know is that JavaScript is dynamically typed and um, I'm assuming everyone who's watching this is a skilled developer and knows what that means. This basically means that you're not going to be declaring variables as int. You're not going to be declaring them a string. You're basically going to be using a keyword that's called var. So whenever I declare a new variable, I simply will just say var my variable 
And so because it's di dynamically typed, my variable is already a string, a type of string, based on how I declared it. That's nothing new to any, this is nothing new to JavaScript. It's, uh, there's a lot of other languages that do that. Um, one thing that is really unique um, about JavaScript is that everything is an object, including primitives. And what I mean by primitives is that string, string is an object. So I could, I could do something like this where I say console log Travis, and because it's an object, it all automatically will have this length associated with it. It it converts that string to an object, and then I'm able to compute the length from that. Um, so I could just go to my console here and refresh and that's not doing anything why is that not doing anything oh, it's probably caching it just take my word for it that does work um, so you could uh, so that even primitives um, do have a length associated with them um, or strings do um, another thing that I uh, want to mention and I'll probably and I'll even talk about this later in this presentation is that functions are what are called first class objects and what that means is, is that functions are considered just like any other variable in JavaScript. So if you declare a string, it's going to create an object. Whereas if you, if you create a function, you can declare it as a variable. Um, and they are treated as variables. And they are passed around as variables. They are considered first class objects. And this is one of the main reasons why you'll find a lot of power within JavaScript is because JavaScript considers functions first class objects. Um, the next thing I want to mention is that um, JavaScript is a what's called a multi-paradigm language, meaning that it is so flexible you can use it for object-oriented pr uh, programming using the uh, prototype. It can be an imperative uh, type of language which, which is basically a procedural type of language. But then it can also be a functional language, um, which is uh, a great example of that is for like uh, like mathematical functions, and you can you can just use it um, in a where where it doesn't store the state, um, whereas imperative does store the state of uh, like an object that you're referring to. So it it's very flexible, highly dynamic, which also creates its own problem, and one of those problems is that it's so flexible that there are so many different ways to implement JavaScript. There are so many um, ways that you can write it. You can declare an object in so many other different ways. And because of this, um, I consider JavaScript patterns um, just as important as the syntax. And so whenever you're learning JavaScript, um, it's, it's highly important to not only learn uh, the syntax on how you do certain things, but it's also extremely important to learn the patterns. Um, there are two resources that I would like for you guys to check out if you have time, and those resources are these right here, which basically talks about patterns in JavaScript and how you can use those patterns. Um, these are really great resources. Um, just an example of what I mean by a pattern. Um, so you could declare an, an object, um, like so you could say like, um, person equals new object. In JavaScript you can do this and then you can say person first is equal to my first name is Travis person last is equal to Tidwell. So this is one way to create an object in JavaScript but you can also do it like this. And these are two different patterns And the second one that I'm actually showing you is a JSON uh, way of doing it. It's, um, it's, this, this is basically the exact same thing up here. However, um, convention and also there's things that are called anti-patterns, which I will kind of talk about a little bit whenever, I, whenever I'm, I'm actually going through some examples. But this is actually considered an anti-pattern, um, whereas this JSON uh, method is considered the 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 uh, way that most people actually do declare objects. So instead of confusing you by showing you the multiple different ways that you can create objects, everything that I present in this um, presentation, I'm going to be talking about what are considered the good practice patterns to do things, such as creating an object using a JSON format. 
The same goes for an array. So like if you wanted to say my array, you could do that as my array like this. And then you could uh, my array, you could push you could push something into that array, whereas the same thing, you could say my array equals brackets. This is basically saying you want to declare an array. Um, and then you could just say Travis. You could do it like this, or you can also my array. You can you can also push items into that array. So this is considered an anti-pattern. This is considered a good pattern. So those, whenever I'm going through these examples and then you go online and look at other examples of JavaScript, they might be doing things differently. Um, and so that's actually a, a big problem with JavaScript is that there's more than, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do things. So check out, please check out patterns and uh, what patterns are considered good and what patterns are considered anti-patterns. So let's talk a little bit about objects, which I kind of did cover this a little bit um, in whenever I talked about patterns. Um, the very first thing that everyone needs to know within JavaScript is what is an object. Um, well, an object, it basically is the same thing as it is in other languages where it's just an unordered collection of key value pairs. Um, so an example is what I just um, what I just did previously. So if I want to declare an object, I just use the squiggly brackets, which uh, is JSON format for object. And then I can just provide key value pairs. Um, the keys need to be strings, um, or you can declare them without the strings because, um, because JavaScript recognizes that we are in JSON mode now. It knows that if I type anything here, that this is the key within the object. So I don't, you could make this a string. Um, this is also allowed. Um, but I just, I feel like it, it looks cleaner and looks more object-like if you leave out the string. So you could just say first and Travis last to well. So one thing I do want to mention here with an object is, so this right here is the key, consider the key. So the syntax is squiggly brackets, key, colon, and then whatever the value is. One thing that's very, very important is that this value could be any primitive or pretty much anything within JavaScript. I can make this a 12. I could make this a function if I wanted to. This value could be anything. Because it's a value, I can assign first to anything. Um, so you'll, you, it's very common to see this pattern uh, within JavaScript where people create an object they have a key, and then as the value, they'll assign that as a function, which is very, very common. And I'll, I'll go over that more in detail later in this presentation. But all you need to know for right now is that objects are declared in JSON format. You have the first and you have the last. You could do this, um, but that's typically, that's typically, that's, that's, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that's considered an anti-pattern, but it's just something that makes it less readable in my opinion. Um, so let's, now that we've declared this object, let's talk about how do we access that, those objects. So uh, accessing the, uh, the parameters within the object. You do this by, um, by simply just using the period. And that will actually give you access to that, um, to that key. And so if I actually did console log here, I'm really curious why my... Um, why this isn't working. So if I did console log here, uncon illegal object, it must be something. What did I do here? It must be something else that's causing it to break. Oh, I, I forgot my, yep, I forgot that. So it did, it did bark at me. Um, so then if I did that, you'll see that I actually printed out Travis, which is my, uh, my, my object first name. So that is how you access parameters within a JavaScript. And, um, and then also whenever I get into functions, I'll talk about how we can actually attach functions to objects as well. So let's move on. Actually, I'm just going to leave that there. I'm just going to remove the console log out of it. Um, so that's what an object is. Let's talk about the elusive function in JavaScript. Um, and the reason why I call it elusive is just because it's, because it's so flexible, it is, it, it's, and because it can be used in so many situations, that also allows um, there. 
whenever you go to learn about functions, you learn about it being used in all these different situations, and it kind of makes it confusing to grasp because in other languages, functions are very, they're very much a, a static thing. You declare functions in one way and you use them in one way. In JavaScript, functions are basically, you can't write JavaScript without writing a function. That's why it's extremely important that when you dive into JavaScript, you understand what a function is. And uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is how do we declare functions. Um, because functions are considered first class objects, we can declare them like any variable. And the correct pattern for declaring a function is to declare it as a pattern. And I'll talk about an anti-pattern for function declarations here in a little bit. So we, we declare a function by declaring a variable. And we will just call this my function. And we, we use the equal sign. Because we're declaring a variable, it has to be equal to something. So I'm assigning a function to that variable. And then we always end it with a semicolon. Uh, this is considered the proper way to declare a function in JavaScript. Um, and I'll, talk, I'll, I'll give you reasons why. Um, so a lot of times you may see this, which this is also allowed and no semicolon, but I will go over in detail why this is considered an anti-pattern of and why you should not declare functions in that way unless you're doing it anonymously or in line. So this is if let's say you just want to declare a function, this is how you do it. Um, there's also a, a, a pattern which is declaring functions within objects, which is just like um, just like what I just showed, I'm going to create a person object, and a person may have a first name. They may have a last name. It'd be awesome if I could spell. But then there may be some type of accessor function called get name, and this is going to just be a function. This is also considered a good practice of how you declare functions. It's, we are basically establishing the context in which that function resides by assigning it to a variable within an object. And I think that's the important thing to remember about functions. It's considered good practice as long as that function has a home. This function has a home because it's assigned to my function variable. Um, and so this function has a home. It's assigned to um, this person object. So we could, in here, say console log or we could return um, this first, and I'll go over the this pointer um, later in this presentation, this last. And then we could end down here, we could say console log person get name. And this is a also considered a good way to get to create functions. So you can see right here, I'm calling person get name with this, which is a function declared within this object and it's returning me the first and last name within that object and I'll go over why that this pointer points to this object um, later on in this presentation um, so these are these are considered um, good ways to create a function another thing is functions can be anonymous and inline and this is another extremely powerful um, thing about JavaScript is that you can you can declare a function anonymously um, and assign it as a callback. So this is this is used a lot whenever you're doing um, whenever you're using callback functions. A great example of this is let's say that we want to do something after two seconds. We would use something called a set timeout. Now set timeout, the way that works is this is, a, this is a native JavaScript function that says execute this after a certain period of time and that this has to be a function. Well, we could, we could do this. So let's say we want to call, let's say we want to call this person get name after two seconds. This is actually allowed, so you'll, you'll have a two second delay and then it should, well, should call person get name. Oh, ah, ah, the this pointer is killing us here. And I'll go over why the this pointer is killing us. Um, I'm what? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, if I did this. Oh, 
Okay, so it might actually work. Undefined, undefined. Yep. And the reason why it's undefined is I will go over why that this pointer would be undefined in this case. So, this is considered an anti-pattern. Whenever you actually pass in a, a referenced, whenever you pass in a referenced function that's elsewhere within set timeout, it's considered an anti-pattern because the set timeout will change the this pointer. And so you don't necessarily know what that will be at that point. What's considered good practice is to use a anonymous inline function. And what an anonymous inline function does is JavaScript assigns this a name. And it basically assigns it that name and it gives it to set timeout. However, within this function, you can now do something such as you could say, uh, you could say person get name if you wanted to. Um, and I don't even know if this, this might actually have a problem with the, this pointer as well. So, no, oh, so it doesn't. So, so by, by, us, um, by us actually explicitly saying person get name, we are, we are setting the this pointer to what the object should be. Um, there's another there's another thing with anonymous inline functions that's that's really confusing and I and I've kind of been referring to it and haven't really explained what that meant, which is that the this pointer kind of gets messed up within inline functions. The reason is is because a function, and I've I've say it right here, functions encapsulate and capture context. And I feel like that's the best statement that I can that I can say about a function. Meaning that whenever you declare a function, that is how JavaScript, that is what JavaScript uses to, um, it to encapsulate variables, but it also uses it to establish context with the this pointer. And um, so this can actually, this can actually, um, this can actually cause a lot of heartache for a lot of developers because they, they get things that they're, they're not expecting uh, within a, a, an anonymous function. And uh, one way to get around that is to um, use what's called a closure. And I want to I want to go into detail of what a closure is, because a closure is used to establish the context within the within um, within like let's say an anonymous function. And to do this, I'm going to jump over to a tool. Um, I'm going to jump over to a tool that's called JS Fiddle. Um, for anybody who wants to just play around with JavaScript, this is a great uh, website that you can go to where you can just type, you can run it, and it will show you what you've done. Uh, but one thing that I want to uh, talk about is using an anonymous function and using what's called a closure and why you would want to use it. Um, to do this, I'm going to set up a variable of colors. This is just going to be an array, so red, blue, green, and yellow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over this, um, this array. So to do that, you could use a for loop. So I'm going to say for var i equals 0, i is less than colors length. Because it's an array, uh, colors has a length. And I'm going to do an i++ plus plus here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say console log colors i. So if I run this, what you're going to see is it prints out red, blue, green, yellow, as you would expect. Now, let's say that inside this for loop, instead of doing something that's synchronous, such as console log, I have to perform something asynchronously, such as whenever you're dealing with um, servers and web services, you deal with this a lot where you may have to make a request to a server, it comes back and you and then you expect to be within the same context as you are within this for each loop. So a good way to simulate this is to use set timeout. So I could say set timeout and I can give it a function and let's say 100 milliseconds. I'm going to just say tidy up. Um, I didn't really, I don't really like the way it tidied that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this inside the set timeout. Um, so who, who, who knows what this would do by default? A lot of people would say, okay, you, you may expect the same thing, red, blue, green, yellow, but to happen at after 100 milliseconds. Well, what really happens is you get this. I called it, and then 100 milliseconds later, I get four undefines. 
the way to really understand what's going on here is you have to do a console log of not only um, colors, but then do a console do a console log of i, and to see what's actually happening here. So I'm going to rerun this. So what what's happening is is my colors is is okay, and uh, that's another thing I do want to mention is why is color why is colors defined here. Um, JavaScript, what it does is if it, if it sees a variable within a certain context, and whenever I say certain context, I mean within a certain function, because functions define context. So colors is not defined within this context. What JavaScript really does is it, it walks up the context tree and locates the next nearest declaration of that variable. If it hits the top, which is basically the window or the document of the page, it basically says this is undefined. That's why colors is defined here. And the same goes for I. But let's actually take a look at what we're seeing. What we're seeing is colors is an array, but now I is four in all, all situations. The reason is, is because after 100 milliseconds has occurred, this for each loop has already, has already completed its execution. And I, at this point, is now four. So, what we have to do here is we have to capture the context of I. This is an extremely important concept in JavaScript, and this is why we use closures. A closure is a way to capture the value of this at any point in time and basically say, I want to establish a new context where I is now the value at which I'm, I'm executing it. So the, the pattern for a closure is you're basically going to create an, a, 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 an anonymous inline function that you execute immediately. So let's actually do that. So we've, got, we've already got an anonymous inline function. What I'm going to do is wrap um, some parentheses around it, which you don't necessarily need the parentheses, but um, uh, Douglas Crockford, who is a, a very well-known um, JavaScript developer, he says that this is actually just good syntax for readability. And then from there, you're actually going to call, you're going to call this function instantaneously using, and using the, um, an, the variable i. So what this actually does is it calls this inline function with the variable i, but we do have a problem here. We're, we're calling the function with i, we're calling it immediately, but there's nothing that's being passed to the function, which is in right here. So we actually need to redefine i here so that whenever we call it, it passes it to the, the function here as a parameter. And what this has done, this has actually captured that value of i within context. And it captures it as that value. Now we do have another problem here in that because we are executing this immediately, set timeout expects a function. If it doesn't get a function, it doesn't know what to do with it. Well, because we are executing this function immediately, we're not returning anything. So what set timeout is actually going to get is nothing. So what we have to do is we also have to return a function. And we do that like this. And what I just did is what's called a closure. Now, I've executed it immediately, and then I'm returning what it expects. And so now, whenever I execute this, because I've actually ca captured the context, you will notice that whenever I execute it now for every single set timeout, I is what I expect it to be, and these are what I expect it to be as well because I have captured that context. This is an extremely important concept in, in JavaScript in that we, you must um, learn what closures are. I think someone's trying to ping me. <laughs> Sweet. So yeah, so that's what, that's what closures are used for, um, which, is, which is extremely important to understand. Let's go back to. Well, set timeout expects a function, so it wouldn't know what to do with it. Well, that's yes, because that's what set timeout expects, and so, so well, so any you could return a variable. I mean, if 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 whatever you're expecting um, expects that variable, I mean, you could return i. I mean, if you just. 
you could do that, but set timeout will throw up on that because you're returning a you're returning a number instead of a function, and it's gonna it'll crash. It, it won't know what to do with that. And so, yeah. I was also gonna ask when you say context a lot, are you also you're referring to the fact that JavaScript's function is too dependent? That's correct. That that's a great point. And so the question was, whenever I'm referring to context. Is that because JavaScript is function scope? And the answer to that is yes. Um, context basically defines the scope. And, and within JavaScript, scope is defined by a function. And so basically what that means is um, whenever I define a function, um, my function... and I declare a variable within this, this variable is defined within the scope of functions so this variable is within this context so yes those those two words can be interchanged um, so yeah so that is basically the power of functions to not only encapsulate and capture context but it's also um, it's also they're also extremely handy whenever you use them anonymously and in line um, keep in mind that they are first class objects so let's move on let me just make this return now, so I don't have any, so I don't have clutter. Um, so now let's go and let's understand the this pointer. Um, the this pointer is another is another thing that just causes a lot of confusion, um, in that it changes or it seems to change whenever you're developing and you're 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 trying to refer to a this pointer. It seems like whenever you're new to JavaScript, like you can't trust the this pointer because you don't know what it's going to be at any time. And the reason for this is primarily a heavy use of anti-patterns. And a great example of that is what I, what I was mentioned to you with the function uh, declaration, which I'll talk about that um, here in a little bit. Um, anti-patterns will cause the, this pointer to just shift beneath your feet, um, which is a, a reason why you shouldn't use them. Um, but once you actually understand what the this pointer is, it's really kind of, it's not that hard to, to use it and to trust it. And really the rule that, that I felt is um, the best rule is in JavaScript, this always refers to the owner of the function we're executing, or rather, to the object that a function is a method of. So, it's all function based. So I think we, I think we can easily define this, the function we're executing. I think that's always that's always understood. So like in that set timeout example that we have up here, this is the function we are executing. So the this pointer is established within this context. However, here is where it gets a little muddy in my opinion. It refers to the owner of that function. I think it's important for us to understand how does one own a function? And um, so Let's talk about that. Let's talk about ownership of functions. And once we once we understand who owns a function, you will understand what the this pointer refers to. The great example, um, the classic example, if I just declare a function um, right here, my function, who is the owner of this function? If I just declare it like this, well, the owner of this func, the owner, if I declare it like this. Um, or actually I can just do it in JS Fiddle. I kind of like JS Fiddle. So let's just do that. So let's just say my function and console log this. And so if I do my function, the, who, do, who do you guys think the owner is on this? I mean, it's, it's, it's not really, I'm, I'm adding this as a variable, but where is this variable really getting added? Um, well, if we think about scope, there's really nothing encapsulating this scope. Um, and so it, whenever there isn't anything doing that, then this will refer to the, the, the document object model. So if I actually execute this, you'll see that this is referring to the window, the DOM. This is what a lot of people see whenever they do console log this. And this is what confuses them. And the reason is, is, is like I said, with use of anti-patterns. Uh, one way to establish the this pointer is to use the, uh, a, is to use what's called the new um, 
is to where if you knew it. And a great example of that, so because a function is a first class, and I'm gonna go into this whenever I talk about object-oriented, which if I have enough time, if you knew this, that will establish context. So I can say var um, my variable, I can call it whatever. If I say new my function, and ever if I execute this, it is now established the this pointer. So whenever I use this, that basically tells the function, okay, the this pointer is now who um, is is now basically pointing to you. This is crucial whenever you move into object oriented development because the this pointer is used all the time in object oriented development. Um, so let's talk a little bit about an anti-pattern. So whenever I was telling you um, that I would go over this in a little bit of why you should never just use function um, test me. So this is considered an anti-pattern way to do a function. Let's, let's watch what happens to the this pointer. Um, whenever we, actually I'm gonna delete this so we don't get any clutter. Um, I'm just gonna, inside of this, I'm gonna say console log this. Um, hang on, where, oh and I just need to say, now in here I'm gonna say test me. This is what bites everyone all the time. Whenever they use anti-patterns, such as just declaring function test me right here, and then they try to use the this pointer inside of that, that anti-pattern creates a problem. And that problem is, is that it, it, this function is not a variable assigned to anything. Keep in mind, a function is a first class citizen. In order for it to be assigned to something, it must first be a variable. Because you are defining it as function test me, it's not being assigned to anything. So the default is the DOM. It's gonna be assigned on the global level. This, this causes all kinds of problems. And this is the reason why declaring functions this way is considered an anti-pattern and you should never use it. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat guilty of this because there are some libraries that I've written where I kind of use this just as kind of a quick hack, but I need to go through and fix them because you should never do this. Um, the, the proper way to do this is to go into a, what, what's considered object-oriented programming, which I'm going to go over next. So that's, that's what establishes the this pointer. Um, so hopefully that kind of, that kind of clarifies it um, a little bit. One thing, and I'll, I will talk about um, whenever I go into object-oriented programming, is how you can pass around the this pointer to other objects using what's the what's called the call method within um, JavaScript. But I'll talk about that when we go into object oriented. And to do that, we must first understand the prototype. So within JavaScript, um, every object has a prototype. Um, and basically what the prototype is, it is an object, just like any other object in JavaScript, but it basically contains the objects which inherits from any parent object. And I'll, this, this becomes a little less muddy as I explain object-oriented. Um, I've already mentioned this, every object has a prototype. And then some browsers expose this with proto. So you can actually do some tests with this, um, with this proto. In fact, you can actually look at this right here in this my function. You'll notice there's this proto object. This is this object's prototype. And it defines this constructor, which is the constructor for that object. And then you'll see that this proto just keeps going, that you can just walk up what's called the proto ladder, the prototype ladder. And that's what people mean is that every object within JavaScript can inherit properties from other objects. And that inheritance is the prototype. The easy analogy that I can think of with prototype is that you, you need to consider a prototype a blueprint. So when you build a new house, and let's say you want to create a new house, you must first have a blueprint. So just because you have a blueprint doesn't mean you have a new house, but you can't have a new house without a blueprint. And the blueprint tells you how to build that house, if that makes any sense. So the prototype is the blueprint. Um, one thing that I do uh, want to show is just real quick that every object, so console log, um, this is actually valid in some browsers. Um, and that every single object has a prototype. You see, it actually gave me that its prototype is string, which means that I declared an object here 
and its prototype is basically the string, which is the properties that it gets from. So now, because I'm using this prototype, I have access to all the string functions such as length, I have italics, I can do index of, I can do font size, I can do all of these functions because I am now using its prototype. And this is what's going to segue us into um, object oriented. Um, before I go on to that though, uh, I do want to mention that the prototype basically says if I the object don't have a property or method that is requested of me, go to the object that this field refer references, my prototype, and look for it. And so this is, this is what JavaScript does whenever you're referencing a property that you yourself have not declared. JavaScript or the, uh, the whatever's executing JavaScript will look at the prototype and it'll walk up the prototype chain until it finds that property. And so we can use this for inheritance. So let's talk about object-oriented programming in JavaScript. So this is going to be fun. And the best way to do this is I'm just going to um, do some, um, some real life uh, walking you through how to build an object. So objects within um, object-oriented is all based on functions. So if I want to declare a new class, you can do it like this. And the name class is, is it could be anything here. This could be like um, my class. I mean, it could, be, it could be whatever. This is not a magic name. But the way that I declared this, I declared it like any other function, right? And I can, I can um, basically say new um, console log. I think we've already done this, new my class. And inside here, I'm just going to say console log the this pointer. And then if I run this, you'll notice that it's pointing to my class. OK. What's really cool here is let's talk about properties within the class. Now that we have the this pointer pointing to my class, you can assign properties using that this pointer. So these would be considered public properties. Because you're associating the this pointer with it, that means anyone outside would be also be able to have access to it. So this, um, I can call this first name, last. And then, um, so let, there, there's my properties. Let's say that I wish to create a method, a public method on top of my class. You could, in fact, there are a lot of people that do this. They say this um, set name. You see this a lot, and this is an anti-pattern, and I'll explain why. Where they, they define the method, they define the method within the constructor, and so then they would say like, um, so this would be like name, Last and they might do some. They might do something like this: um, equals first, last. So you see this a lot, and the reason why this is an anti-pattern is because every time that this is declared, we have to reinitialize and reset up this function, and it also does not allow for inheritance. The best way to do this is to use the prototype. We are going to establish the blueprint for my class, and we're going to do this using the prototype prototype um, set name so it looks similar but because we assigned it to its prototype we are basically saying assign this to this cl this class's blueprint keep in mind we are establishing a blueprint here and then inside here we still have the this pointer So this is how you declare objects within, or object-oriented objects within, within JavaScript. Um, just for lack of time, I could go into how you can do like private, public, whatever, um, which I can probably do in another session, but I do want to go over inheritance. And to do that, I'm going to create, um, I'm going to create some, in fact, I'm just going to go through my last example, which is going to go into inheritance, um, which is actually building jQuery plugins with object-oriented programming. Um, this is this is a practical example that I'm going to build for you guys that is going to show me walking through how you can build a new plugin with jQuery. Um, for those who want to watch the video at a later time, here is the pattern that you can use. 
um, where you basically you you uh, extend the jQuery FN is the jQuery prototype, so I'm extending the jQuery prototype with my plugin. I might pass it options. You then return, um, it, so jQuery iterates over all the instances that you say is my plugin. So here I'm iterating over all the instances, and all I'm doing is saying new my plugin. So let's actually build this, just real quick. Hopefully I can get this done real quick. So class box, and over here I'm going to say box is width, uh, we'll say 100 pixels, uh, background, color is blue. And this is going to be, say, click me. So when I run that, you should see, uh, let me make the color white. So here's my click me box that I have here. So what I want to do is build that, that crazy game where if you hover over it, it like moves it around and you can't actually click on it. I'm actually going to build that using object oriented. There's obviously there's a, there's a lot of easier ways to do this, but what I want to do is show you how you can do this using, um, how you can use this using object oriented. So the first thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to create a display class. And it's going to take a context. And so the context is actually going to be the jQuery context. And so what I want to do, and because I'm using inheritance, I may, and I'll show you, I'll be, I'll be instantiating display to, um, to establish the prototype on all my um, derived classes. Um, I want to make sure that I don't call an init function unless I actually have a context here. And then all I'm going to do in here is I'm just going to call a init function. Okay? And that's all my display is going to do. And then, then I, have to I have to define that, that init function. Prototype init equals function. Okay? Now, what I want to do, that's all the display has to do. Let's say that I want to create um, a class that's called um, blue, uh, blue box, or actually let's just call it blocks. So var box is equal to function. Now to within the constructor, there's this there's this thing called super that you guys are probably familiar with with an object oriented. Super is basically you just calling the display, calling the super class with your this pointer, and this brings me to this function called call. This is a special function that allows me to pass my this pointer to other objects. And so what I'm actually doing is I'm calling the display, but I'm actually saying use my context instead. And that's what call does. So the very first thing I want to do here, and then what I want to do is override this init function. So I'm going to say box prototype init equals function. And because I want to also call my, my super class, I have to call its prototype first. Okay, and then I can do anything here. Um, and so there we go. So there's the box. Now this actually doesn't actually do anything yet. Um, all that I've been doing is inheriting. But let's say that I want to change this from being blue to red. And I want to create a class for that, so that if I if I create a red box, hopefully I don't get sued for this. So if I create a red box, it's going to derive from box, and let me make sure I get my semicolons. And then it's red box. I'm running out of time, aren't I? Prototype. Pro. little under 10 minutes. I think I can accomplish this in that time. Because this is neat. Uh, I want to derive from box. However, I want to change the this display. Oh, I need to establish what the this display is. So this is what's really cool. In the actual base class, I can say this display equals context. And what that means is, is now anybody deriving from display, so red box derives from box, box derives from display, and display sets this variable 
called this display and it sets it to the context. I now have access to this display here. And I'm going to set, change the CSS background color to red. And let's actually new this. Oh, there's one thing I'm missing and I can't believe I forgot this just because I'm in a hurry. Whenever you're actually defining um, the, uh, whenever you're deriving from base classes, it's real important that you copy over the prototype. That's one thing that's crucial whenever you're doing object-oriented programming. So the way you actually do that is you say box prototype. So I want to set my prototype to a new display type. What this is doing is this is actually establishing my prototype to match that of a new display. But there's only, there's only one caveat here. Whenever you do this, it also overrides my constructor, meaning that if I said new box, it would end up calling display instead. So what I have to do is I have to reset that. Prototype constructor equals box. This pattern right here is how you derive. These, these three lines, you define the function that, that calls the class and then you reset the constructor back to box. And then we just have to do the same thing down here for red box. And then this just becomes box. So that's how you create an object. So now if I actually say new, um, new red box. And what I want to do is I want to pass in this context of this box. Well, I have to, I have to load the DOM first. And so in J J JavaScript, jQuery, to do that, you use this. Make sure the DOM is loaded. Oh my gosh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I promise. Um, so now I'm going to say box. I'm just going to pass in that context. And I'll be surprised if this actually does anything because I did it in such a hurry. Um, so now new red box init that calls init. So let's actually just see what we got here. Console log. It's always good to add. It's always good. Um, right here. Yeah, I wonder if that's what. I don't think that's what did it. Uh, context box call this new um, display new box knit prototype well I could go on debugging this but I want you to take my word for it dang it um, well this is this is I'm passing it to the J, jQuery and so it should create a new, new red box. Yeah, uh, yeah. I the only problem is is in in JS Fiddle. I don't know how to I don't know how to find the script that's actually loaded up in here. I don't I don't think my init function is getting called. Undefined context class box div. Box. What is this? Console log. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> okay. Important thing to note here you have to pass along your constructor context. You have to pass along your constructor uh, parameters. Let's see if this works now. There it is. It turned red. Now we can do something even more crazy. So now because we have a base class, we can add business logic to the base class and it'll apply to anybody who derives. So I could just say this display CSS. I can do something really wacky here. I could say, um, actually I'm going to say this display mouse over function and I'm going to say CSS and then I'm going to do a margin 
left. Four. These are all. Um, I'm just going to send it to a random location. And what's cool about this is because I'm adding this to the base class, it applies to anybody who derives from my class. Yeah, that would work. That would help, wouldn't it? Oh, 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 oh. And see, there it goes. It's bouncing around. What's cool though is now I've also taught you, I've also shown you a little bit on how you can create themes for jQuery plugins. And so now what's awesome about this is now that I have classes that define my business logic, I can easily turn this into a jQuery plugin by just overriding the prototype by doing something like this to where I say um, jQuery fn, which is the prototype, red box equals, okay, and then right here I'm going to say return jQuery this each. And then I'm going to say new red box, and I'm going to pass it the context. And that, that right there is all you need to integrate with jQuery now. And so now, instead of actually saying, um, instead of my, my code down here that was, that looked like this, where I said new, I could, I could now just say, box, red box, like that. And now I suddenly have a jQuery that will end up just declaring a new object, passing in the, the context, and then you now have object-oriented software that is controlling a jQuery widget. And so this is how I, this is how I uh, design most of my, um, my jQuery widgets these days, is I actually start with the class and then I easily, you can easily pull it into jQuery at that point after, after you're done. And so that is pretty much it. I, I, I hope I covered everything. I kind of got a little bit um, fast there towards the end. But hopefully, um, hopefully I was able to cover most of the stuff that I wanted to on building object-oriented classes that derive from each other. Um, one thing that you guys can invest, can experiment with this, which I've also also done this, is you can pass options. So you can have um, so you can have options that pass into this, and you can de decide what class to declare. So you could have a class called Blue Box, and you can within one of your options you could say, hey, I want to. Um, you could actually just make this box and say, I want this to be red. And based on the option, you can decide to declare a different class, which then does something different, but it all derives from this base class. So that if you don't have, if you don't have um, certain things, you can just always just declare the, the base class instead. So there's a lot of experimenting that you can do here to make this even more flexible, but um, I'm just going to kind of leave that up to the people watching the video and the people that are online. So I'm going to open this up for questions. I think maybe we, we may have... Um, we may have maybe five minutes to go through some questions. So go ahead, guys. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, let me actually make this so it works. Um, what I'll do is I'll play around with it later um, after this and just and make, clean it up a little bit and then I will share this fiddle with you of me actually building this this little widget. Okay, yeah, I'll, I definitely will do that. Um, so the people online who are watching this, they're basically just asking if I will post this code um, along with the video, which I will post this code along with the video. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, hi, Jared. Um, whenever you declare your um, prototype, it looks an awful lot like you're, you're basically declaring yourself. Like, so you're doing something like uh, box.prototype equals new fin. And then that's how many. Or box.prototype.fin equals new box. Mm -hmm. And that's just, 
Yep, so the question was, um, it kind of goes against logic whenever I'm declaring the prototypes and I'm setting it to new box, but new box declares its prototype as new display. And so there's, there kind of seems to be some like recursion, recursion um, initialization of classes that kind of goes against um, certain logic. Is, I mean, hopefully I regurgitated your, your question okay. But the answer to that is, keep in mind, whenever we actually define this, this is executed immediately. Um, so whenever we're actually setting up the box, we are only establishing this prototype once. And what that means is now every single time I create a new red box, its prototype has already been established because this line is only executed one time and it's only executed to establish the blueprint based on its parent class. And so whenever you say prototype equals new display, what that does is it does execute this constructor and you notice what I did here, I made sure that I don't even want to call my init unless I have a context. And this, this keeps my derivations, what I'm doing here, to call my init function. So this, this is actually a good pattern that you see a lot, is that you have like, this is kind of like a faux constructor, and then you'll see what people do is they create an, an init method that acts as like a real constructor. So if you want to do something that's only executed when that object is instantiated, you can create this init function which is only created whenever you have a context or whenever you pass something in here, if that makes any sense. So yes, this does declare, but it's only being declared once and it's only being declared to copy over the prototype. And then all we're doing here is we're, because this is, this is, aggressive, it copies everything including the constructor, we want to make sure that whenever we say new red box that we're not actually doing a new box instead of red box. So we have to reset the constructor back to red box. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? Okay guys. Well, I really appreciate you doing uh, coming to this Eaton Geek. I will be posting this on YouTube and sharing it with the world. Um, again, we are all developers from allplayers.com, and we do this every week just to get better and to learn and to share. So thanks, everyone, for watching, and see you again soon.